Hi everyone, I'm Rose Martin and we are right around the corner at beautiful Smith Mountain Lake with Susan Coriel. Susan's specialty is a cozy mystery and a southern gothic. We're going to be chatting with her, this lifelong educator, about her series, The Overhome Trilogy, in just a few minutes. But we have to just, first of all, Susan, I have to ask you, and welcome to Right Around the Corner. Thank you. What is a southern gothic? <sighs> okay, obviously it takes place in the south. It usually involves uh, an old house, a mansion, and generally there are ghosts or spirits of some kind. There might also be uh, someone with a, what we call a sort of a grotesque problem, physical or mental, a hunchback, a lame person, someone who's kind of a psycho. Uh, those are the general requirements. So how did a retired educator 30 years get into this type of work? Well, I like to say the ghost slipped into my surprise. Oh, that sounds interesting. Uh, yeah, you know, I've always been interested in the South. Mm -hmm. I was born in the South. I have grown up in Virginia all of my life. And um, I, I've always been interested in the fact that um, Southerners seem to be sort of hooked on hard felt, long held beliefs that sometimes clash with modern ideas. And um, so the, the Southern idea was always there. And then when I began to think about uh, the history that might be behind a book that I would write, I began to think about plantations because, you know, we're famous for that in the South and mm -hmm. in Virginia, and tobacco especially, tobacco plantations. And as I was doing research, um, like I say, the ghost just kind of slipped in. But although I did have a little inspiration. My husband uh, was a real estate broker and he had listed a house, an old, plantation in the Hunt country of Virginia that was rumored to have a ghost. So I, I got to see the house. It was Ooh, beautiful. This sounds like a great story. Uh, well, it's what inspired me to kind of press on with this idea. And I tried really hard, probably too hard, to get the ghost or the spirit, if there was one, to interact with me. But I didn't. I couldn't. And neither could my husband. However, he said, every time one of his agents would take a family in, mm -hmm. a child would say, oh, I'm Ooh. afraid or really? I don't want to go in there, or did somebody die in there? I mean, those are the things kids would say. Mm, so the little ones were picking up on they it, but were the adults picking weren't. Up. Yeah, uh, pretty much. But that's it all sort of rolled together. And then when I retired down to Smith Mountain Lake, um, I just thought, oh, this is the perfect place for a Southern Gothic. Mm -hmm. mm, it sure is. Now, you grew up in Virginia? Yep. Um, in the same area? Fairfax County, which is north. Uh, Northern Virginia. I know Southern Virginia doesn't always recognize mm -hmm. the fact that we are in the state, but um, it was not urban at all where I grew up. I grew up in Herndon, mm -hmm. and when I left to go to college, the census, there were 2,000 people in the town. Wow, that's quite different than today. Quite different. It was a dairy farming uh, place, mm -hmm. and both of my parents graduated from Herndon High School. So, I mean, I am a native. Um, and we would go to parties uh, later, my husband and I, when we were married, and people would say, oh, where are you from? And mm -hmm. we'd say, we're from here. And they'd right. say, no, nobody's from here. Right. And, yes, we're from here. We're natives. You are. Yeah. So growing up, did you, did you have a family of writers? Were your parents writers? Well, interestingly, neither parent was a writer, although both are big readers. Mm -hmm. But my mother's father was a lawyer by trade, but he was a published poet. Mm. And something in the DNA, because I have two brothers, both prolifically published, I write, um, and most of my brother's children are writers, and at least one of my grandchildren is now pretty much presenting as a writer, 10-year-old. Mm. Mm -hmm. How about your children? Any writers in the family? Uh, yes, all three are published. All three? All three, and my daughter uh, has a degree in writing, and she married a writer. Well, I would say that this whole family then, <laughs> who knows uh, the amount of writing that, that yeah. you guys are doing. That's wonderful. Do, so do you share stories with each other? Oh, do you constantly. share each other's work? Constantly. Do you edit each other's work? Yes. Yes. Uh, my brother, um, Tom, uh, is just one of my best editors. Uh, and. I've got some funny stories about his perception of things versus mine. Tom is a very, very brilliant, erudite college professor, dean, president of the college type, you know, mm -hmm. who writes mostly scholarly things, but he really likes my gothics and my mm -hmm. cozy mysteries, and so we get into some interesting um, conversations. And uh, my daughter reads and helps me edit everything, 
And in fact, my youngest son's wife is, she's not a writer, but she's a librarian. So it's still in the family. It is, it is. I, we just have a, a great situation. <laughs> it sounds like it's fun. I bet yeah. family reunions are fun at your they house. They are, they are, yeah. So what's a cozy mystery? Okay, um, that's another interesting one. Um, most people think Agatha Christie. Um, I think of it as a little bit different from Agatha Christie. Yes, they usually take place in a rural, pastoral kind of a setting, mm -hmm. sort of like Smith mm -hmm. Mountain Lake. Beautiful, right? Yeah. Again, that's why it was a perfect setting for my mm -hmm. stories. Um, they will have characters that, n that not necessarily you know, but that you feel like you know somebody like them. Mm -hmm. And uh, if there is any blood or sex or overt violence, it's pretty much off the page. It's not in your face. That's why it's cozy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you can so when you think about a cozy mystery and these southern gothic novels, what age group? Well, I write what's called new adult with a twist. A lot of new adult is what they call edgy, okay? I don't like edgy. I don't read it, and I certainly don't write it. It's a little too... Edgy. Edgy. <laughs> you got it. Uh, but the new adult appeals to, say, as young as high school kids and beyond. Um, college kids, adults. I mean, I have lots of... I have men who read my Mm -hmm. My cozy mysteries. I, one of the first reviews I got on a Red Red Rose. I am a male, and I loved this book. Great. And so um, new adult. I think that's that's what my category is. Were you encouraged to write and express that creativity when you were a child? I did not need encouragement. Um, I needed to be stifled. Oh really? Yeah, really. Um, I'll tell you this little um, vignette. When I was in third grade, I went home and I said to my mother. I want to write letters to my girlfriends in my class. Mm -hmm. So she helped me address the envelopes and we put them in the mail. And one by one, my girlfriends called me and said, Susan, I got your letter. What fun, that was so nice of you. I hung up the phone after about the fifth call and I looked at my mother and I said, what is wrong with these people? They're supposed to write back. Oh. And my mother said, Susan, they're not all writers like you. Mm. So no, I, I've always been a writer. That's wonderful. And when you, when you write, do you find that it's therapeutic for you or does it help you? Some people exercise, right? Some people bake. Some people feel drawn to do something. With you, that, that yearning and that special something is writing. Uh, definitely. And in fact, when I finished my very first book, which is unpublishable, by the way, but I finished it. It had a beginning, a middle, and the end. And I said, wow, I feel like I have painted a mural, mm. you know. Uh, a masterpiece. Well, it wasn't, but I, uh, <laughs> it, it was a very um, cathartic almost feeling, you know, to have actually done mm -hmm. it because you know what, writers have to write. What was the story? It was called Double Header, and it was loosely based on my twin brothers, five years older than I am. One was a pitcher and one was a catcher, and they telepathized their signals to each other. Possibly a Disney book with a lot of tweaks, maybe, but... Mm -hmm. um, I did finish it. So you just said writers have to write. They do. What does that mean? You, you just have something inside you that says, write, write. I don't care if you have three children, your husband owns his own business and you're the department chair, write. So that, when I wrote my first book that was published, Eagle Bait, I did it in the summer. I was teaching school, had three kids at home. I would shut my door to my little office and I put a note on the door that said, do not knock unless you are bleeding profusely. <laughs> Five minutes later, knock, knock, knock. What's profusely mean? You know, uh -uh. they would slip notes under the door and everything. But I was determined. I was by then close to 40 years old and I said, I have to write a book that can be published. And I did it, it took me three summers, but I did and it was published. Good for you. Yeah. What's your process like? <sighs> Every writer has a different process, I am convinced. I know many, many, many writers. Those in my family also belong to Lake Writers here at Smith Mountain Lake, and I have lots of colleague writers whom I'll never meet. They're cyber colleagues, but um, we're all different. Um, there are really like two things I need to explain. One is, and I learned this through my cyber colleagues, there are two kinds of writers. Plotters, those who write plots, mm -hmm. and pantsers, 
And it took me the longest time to figure out what a pantser. Yeah, what does that mean? It means you write by the seat of your pants. You sit down uh -huh. and you just write. You don't plan it. You don't outline. No, you, you don't have it ready to go. let the muse come to you and tell you what to write. Well, that is not me. That is so not me. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a very firm beginning, middle, and end. And they rarely fluc fluctuate. Mm -hmm. They do not change. They are not in flux. What comes in between those three parts does change. Uh, depending on my other process. Uh, and that is that I have to tell my stories. I am a storyteller. So you tell them out loud I while you're in the process of, of writing the book? I am oh, in the process of, a process of writing a book. And because my family is full of these writers, right. I usually have a friendly ear. Now, my children did get tired of it. <laughs> and they would see me coming with a manuscript and they would turn around and run the other way. Uh, eventually, but um, and my poor long-suffering husband, bless his heart, he listens to everything I write. So, do you read the manuscript, or do you just tell the story like I do an both. oral story, and then I do both. figure out how it's going to come together? I read a half chapter after I've written it, and then Ned and I, basically, or my lake writers and I, or my family and I, we talk about it. They'll ask me questions. Um, they'll and t uh, Ned is very good. My husband is very good of say by saying uh, saying things like. I don't think she'd say that, or would he say that that way, or, you know, that kind of thing. That helps. And mm -hmm. then I say, no, 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 no. How would she say it? You know, what did he mean? And we talk about it, and he is a great help. So, and then you mentioned the Lake Writers Group. What's that? Yes, it's, um, it's a group critiquing. It comes under um, the Smith Mountain Arts Council umbrella. It's one of the many, many services and, you know, programs that they have. And it's just a loose group of every kind of writer you'd ever meet in your life. It's a really quirky group. Mm -hmm. Talk about quirky people. Writers are quirky. We have people writing memoirs. We've got poets. We've got nonfiction. We've got fiction, short stories, romance, mystery, crime. I mean, you name it. It's there. And we meet twice a week um, in libraries. And um, anybody who wants can read. And you have 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then we critique, and it's it's friendly critiquing, but it's it's good critiquing because we all know what's what's good writing, mm -hmm. even though we all write different things. We we know good writing when we hear it, and we make suggestions. And I, I've gotten many wonderful suggestions. Uh, from but is that writers. hard though, in a way, because you're you're vulnerable, right? You've got this mm -hmm. story that's close to your heart, mm -hmm. and you're putting it out there for people thinking, I don't know, they might not like it, and they might, I'm kind of really married to these characters, and I mm -hmm. feel close to them. Mm -hmm. Is that hard to take that feedback? It, it was at first, but now I really, crit I, I really relish the criticism, because mm -hmm. it helps me make it better. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm into publishing, if I were just writing this for myself, you know, or to pass on to my kids, I might say, uh, who are you to criticize me, you know? And maybe we don't call but it criticism, right? Maybe we call it, it feedback. It's constructive yeah. criticism, mm -hmm. and it is definitely feedback. But I, and, and, and I will, will say, if, if there's, nobody says anything bad, I'll say, oh, come on, how can I improve this? You know, what, what did you think about this particular wording or that particular scene? And that's what we do with each other. Do you base your books on real people? No, not really. Uh, not really? Not, not I don't know. You said no, then maybe not uh, really. It depends on which books. Um, <laughs> there is one book, the, the book that uh, is based on my 30 years of teaching. Um, there is not a single real person in there, but there are whole lots of people in there that I have interacted with in one way or another. Mm -hmm. you know, over the course of the Over the, the course of the 30 years. Uh, so even the characters in your, in your trilogy, they're not based on people you know. No, they really are so not. So then where does that inspiration come from to create these viable, just really rich characters and then place them in all of these situations? You know, it's hard for me to explain that. I just think they're there. And they, when I really sit down and work on it, they come, they come to life. They don't talk to me. I sometimes wish they would. Mm -hmm. uh, as some, some writers, you know, their right. characters will talk to them. Mine, mine do not talk to me. But I, I, I guess it's inspiration is the only mm -hmm. thing I can call it. And a lot of times I will get inspiration when I'm walking or when I'm down on my dock, kind of vegetating or just relaxing. Um, 
the idea will come to me. Oh, now I know where they're going to find that, whatever it is that's mm -hmm. been lost or, or whatever. So do you write from morning? Do you have a special time in the morning? Do you I'm write a, mornings? Yeah, I'm a morning person. Um, and so a cup of coffee or two, and i got to make sure my kitchen's neat first. Mm -hmm. you know, no dishes in the sink or anything. And then I go up to my little loft, which looks right out on Smith Mountain Lake. Oh, it's how a, beautiful. It is I a beautiful I could find view. inspiration there, too, it's right? It's very inspiring and uh, sometimes inspires me to goof off, and I find myself down at the dock sort of hypnotized. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and then I write in the morning, and by, and by 2, 3 o'clock, I'm done. I'm done. If I try to write after that, I find I'm delete, delete, mm -hmm. delete the next day. So your creative, your creative time is midday. Yeah. What inspired you as a child? What books or authors that Gosh. were the ones that you thought, you know, I can do this? You know, when you're in third grade and you're writing those letters to your right. friends, you know, you're thinking, I can do this. Well, I, w I was a voracious reader. Um, in fact, I went to a little tiny elementary school, and I read all the books in the library. Really? Yeah, they just didn't have any more. Mm -hmm. And um, I loved those biographies uh, of the children when they were children. George Washington, when he was a child. I remember they had an orange cover. There was a whole row of them, and I just whoosh, read them all at once. And then I went through all the Nancy Drew books, finished all of those by the time I was in the fourth grade. All of the Bobsy Twin books. I still mm -hmm. have the originals upstairs in my mm -hmm. secretary. They're falling apart. All of the Dana Girl books. All of the Hardy Boy books. So, yeah. So, if you're not writing and you're enjoying this beautiful lake or your grandchildren and your children, what are the things that, that you really love to do? If, oh, gosh. If you've got free time and you're thinking, you know what? I'm just going to take some time for me today. What would that day look like? Well, this morning I did yoga with my yoga class. Mm -hmm. Absolutely love that. We actually have come. She's my class has come here and and done yoga down on my dock. Um, I love to kayak. Um, I like to golf. Well, I, I call it golf. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not very good at it. Um, I walk every day with with neighbors and friends. Um, I go to my lake writers meetings. Um, I'm in two book clubs. And we read 12 books in each one a year. So I'm reading 24 books. You're a busy lady. I'm a busy lady. Uh, and I do a lot of critiquing for my cyber colleagues, my writers. What's that like, having cyber a cyber group? It is wonderful. It is the perk. Because I love to write the books. I love to create the books. I even like to edit the books. I'm mm -hmm. crazy. I don't mind the editing like most people do. I hate promoting them. Golly, what an effort, you know, to try to sell them. I just, I'm just not good at it marketing and promotion. But in having to do that, I have just met all of these wonderful, wonderful writers. And we, we critique each other, we support each other, we help each other. And I mean, we even get personal, oh, my husband's sick, or oh, my child is, you know, sure. whatever. And I, I have got dozens, I will never meet them. Some of them are over, live overseas, Australia and England. And I have one really good friend, Cindy Sample. She is in California. We will never meet physically, mm -hmm. but um, it's wonderful. Has technology changed the way you write or your approach oh, to your characters or your books? Not, not the approach to what I write, but how I write, using the computer and using the internet and mm -hmm. Facebook and Twitter and you know, all those things to promote the, the, that's all totally changed. You submit everything electronically now. You used to mail the manuscripts mm -hmm. out and wait and go to your mailbox every day and wait and wait to see if there's a rejection or not. And now it just boom, boom, it's, you know, it has changed the, the writing, the physical writing itself, mm -hmm. but not but not your inspiration no. for the characters. Or That's creation. all still the same, the way you create. Yeah. So you've had 30 years in education. You have so many published books, award winner for Eagle Bait and Murder Principle, and this trilogy we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. You've got this beautiful house at the lake that we've invited, that you've invited us to, and thank you so much for that. What are you most proud of? Wow, I don't know about the word pride. I, I just wrote a guest blog. The, it was called Tuesday Treasures. What do you treasure? Can I talk about what I treasure? Sure. Okay. And I used a Mark Twain quote, supposedly Mark Twain, who said, happiness is not having what you want. It's wanting what you have. Mm. And I Let's want. sit with that for a second. Yeah. Say it again. Not happiness is not having what you want. Oh, I want this, I want that, I want that. It's wanting what you have. Mm -hmm. Being grateful. Being grateful. And I am grateful that I have this house and that I have seven grandchildren mm -hmm. and that I have time to write 
after being a full-time working mother. I had no time to write. I had to shut myself in the door and let my children bleed profusely mm -hmm. before I would take care of them. And so it's just, I, I love everything I have. I, I, and your health. You're busy doing yoga. I'm busy. And doing these other I have things. lots of friends. I have a huge mm -hmm. congregation of friends in the neighborhood and in my church and uh, everywhere. And I just, um, I'm grateful for what I have. So the first book of your Overhome trilogy, A Red, Red Rose, this is that cozy mystery southern gothic novel. We have a character who's in a beautiful mansion and we have an ancestral ghost and some other characters. Share a little bit about this first book in the trilogy. Okay. Um, it, as I said, it was inspired by um, a, a mansion, a historic plantation in the hunt country of northern Virginia. But I never got around to writing the book then. So when I retired to Smith Mountain Lake, I thought this is a perfect place. I'm gonna just move that setting right on down south. And I did a little research at the Bedford Museum and found there was a house, a plantation that's still standing, uh, even after the lake had been filled. And um, so I had my prototype and I was ready to go. And when I started writing, I got the first, it was into the first chapter, I realized there, there was a ghost in that house uh, and that ghost was in Ashby's room. Ashby's my protagonist, she's 20 year old. And um, it was a comforting kind of a ghost there, at least at first, but it kept leaving red roses for her everywhere. And she couldn't decide whether they were a symbol of love or maybe fear or blood or they're red, you know, what is this all about? And so mm -hmm. that's how that particular ghost de uh, developed. Mm, would you read a passage for us? Sure. Now this one doesn't really involve Rosabelle the ghost. Uh, this takes place in the dining room though at Overhome Plantation. And this is um, the Uncle Hunter, Aunt Monica, and Ashby's seven-year-old cousin Jeff. She's come to Overhome Plantation to be an au pair for her seven-year-old cousin. This room and the keeping room next door are what we consider the original house, though they were actually part of a barn, my uncle pointed up. Your room, Ashby, is right above us. That barn was built back in the 18th century. Overtons have lived on this land for over 200 years. I took in the floors covered in carpet and the walls papered in silk. For sure it did not look like a barn, but things somehow sounded different and felt different in this room. I jerked back my attention to my uncle. And by the mid-1800s, Overhome was a thriving southern plantation. The great house had been expanded from the barn, and the slave quarters, kitchen house, and sheds fanned out behind. Some of the ruins of these buildings still exist out in the yard. Slave quarters? Did you say slave quarters, I asked? Well, yes. In order to survive at the time, Overhome depended on a small cadre of slave labor, as did all the plantations. I believe at one time there were as many as several dozen slaves living and working at Overhome. But, but, but slavery? I could not wrap my mind around the idea that my own family had been slaveholders. It was a deplorable practice, no question about it. Nonetheless, slavery was the basis for our southern economy then. Oh, was all I could muster. Well, of course, I'd studied U.S. history. I knew about slavery in the South, but it was a completely abstract idea. The professor lectured, the text described, it was too long ago, too far away to be real. I said, if I had thought about it, I guess I would have realized, I trailed off. It's just hard to visualize people sitting in this room being served by slaves. I find it hard to accept. The war between the states ended all that, thankfully. Though no one can be proud about slavery, we Overtons still hold our Confederate warriors as heroes. My great-great-grandfather, Burwell Overton, reigns resplendent in his rebel grays in our portrait gallery. My uncle pointed toward the portrait wall. Burwell served with Jubal Early, I believe. They made but Murley still salutes that painting every time he enters the house. A half smile escaped Uncle Hunter's lips. But the Overtons were able to stay solvent, actually prosper after the war. Jeff sat patiently listening. Then they built the dam, right, Dad? flooded the rivers and sank all our outbuildings, the old slave houses and the family cemetery and everything. He made a swooshing sound and a plunging gesture to illustrate his point. There's all kinds of buildings and roads and trees and stuff way down at the bottom of the lake. He blinked his eyes in excitement. A whole underwater town, kind of spooky, huh? 
One time, Dad and me went to the Baptist church and looked for our names on the old tombstones where they'd moved the graves. We used charcoal over paper. At that moment, my aunt arrived. Our talk floated through the flickering distortions of candles as I allowed the sense of the ancient room to flow around me. Generations of my family had sat at this very table, their conversations ebbing and flowing and settling into the porous barn wood where the rise and fall of their voices, their very words, were trapped forever. Mm. And this is only the first. So this is an interesting passage that you chose because knowing the second book and the third book, you have Ashby moving also through this mansion. And does she greet other ghosts in book the second and the third? Yes, in the, in the second book, Beneath the Stones, five years later, she is now the owner of Overhome Estate. Okay. And she needs to sell a bit of it off and finds an old overseer's cottage. And there mm. is a spirit in there that is mean and angry. And he has no intention of letting her tear down that building. And she's got to find out why. And how about the third? The third one, nobody knows. Uh, a tall, dark stranger uh, meets Ashby. He's African-American, and he says, I think we may be related. And so uh, he is now finding his roots, and um, indeed they are related, and uh, all the ghosts that were slaves just come out of the woodwork. <laughs> you know, you left the door open for a number four. You know, I've had people say that, but my answer to that is, don't you know that a trilogy involves three books? There you go. <laughs> there you go. What's next for you? Uh, well, I do have my latest, mm -hmm. uh, A Murder of Principle. This one just came out in March of this year, and it kind of involves my 30 years of teaching, and it's a sort of a what if. What if you had such a terrible principle that everybody wanted to kill her? And that's pretty much what happens in that one. Are you um, working on something currently? I, what I am working on is kind of exciting to me. Um, I have a local film production that's working on a film version of A Red, Red Rose. It's in its infant stages. Uh, but uh, we're thinking about um, local setting and maybe local actors and probably a little local fundraising. Uh, but um, it sounds like a lot of fun. It is. And I can't wait to see it. I'll be in line getting tickets early on. <laughs> but special thanks to you for inviting us here to your home at beautiful Smith Mountain Lake and sharing all of your work with us. Oh, thank I'm you. grateful. Thank you for coming. So special thanks to Susan Coriel for having us here at Smith Mountain Lake to share all of her work, her cozy mysteries, and her southern gothic novels. And thanks to you for staying with us. I'll see you next time when we're right around the corner.